Good evening and thanks for joining us. The top stories today. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has resigned. He's known for his signature economic strategy, Abenomics. We talked to Tress's chief economist Daniel Akaya to see what his legacy will be. New developments in the U.S.-China dispute. The Chinese government says Chinese people will boycott Apple products in retaliation to Trump's WeChat ban. We spoke to a Silicon Valley businessman about why he chose not to do business there. The U.S. and Taiwan paved the way for a free trade deal. Taiwan is easing restrictions on American beef and pork imports. We talked to the president of the U.S.-Taiwan Business Council. Now, one of my favorite stimulus ideas, the UK government's Eat Out to Help Out plan ends this month. We hear from a restaurant owners there about whether it was a success. Japan's longest serving Prime Minister Shinzo Abe is resigning. He suffers from a non-curable bowel disease and felt now was the right time to step down. Starting in the late 80s, Japan saw a long period of stagflation after a real estate crash. Abe came along with his own economic cure called Abenomics. I asked Daniel Akaya, chief economist at Tresses, if the approach will change now that Abe's gone. I don't think it will make uh, a lot of difference. If we look at the different proposals for economic policy in Japan, all of them go down the same unfortunate path, which is more debt, more government spending, more so-called stimulus, and uh, the continued problem that we have seen since uh, the real estate bubble burst in the late 80s. I think that uh, Japan started a very dangerous path that uh, the Eurozone followed as well, which is to try to disguise structural problems with uh, high levels of debt and high levels of government spending. It has hurt growth, it has hurt productivity growth, and more importantly, it has massively hurt real wages for workers. So Daniel, Abenomics, I believe you weren't a proponent of it. What should they have done instead? Abenomics was based on the so-called three arrows. The first arrow was higher government spending. The second was monetary stimulus. And the third one was structural reforms. They completely forgot the third one. That is the big problem, is that they relied the entire improvement of the economy on massive money printing, huge monetary stimulus and government spending, and the structural reforms to make the economy more competitive, to attract investments, to make uh, productivity growth improve, those were completely abandoned, not even implemented, actually. So I think that um, the, the, the problem is that uh, if they continue with the these same policies, the result is going to be the same. And uh, copying the policies that Japan has implemented, be it in the United States or in the Eurozone, is very dangerous. Because in Japan, there are some very differentiated things. For example, the labor force is very strict and very obedient. That is not the case in the United States and definitely not in the Eurozone. Also, it is a very closed uh, demographic uh, environment. Uh, it's, a, it's a country that does not receive lots of immigration. And it's an aging population added to a diminishing population. So we have to be extremely cautious about the idea of repeating, and Japan truly needs to start implementing structural reforms that allow uh, small and medium enterprises to thrive, that allow businesses to improve productivity and with it real wages, and that stop relying on disguising structural problems with huge spending and huge monetary stimulus. Daniel, I appreciate your insights as always. Hope you have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you very much. Same to you. Beijing is warning that Chinese people will throw away their iPhones if President Trump's WeChat ban moves forward. We hear from a Silicon Valley, a former Silicon Valley businessman, who refused to move his business to China exactly for that reason. NTD's Phil Zhou reports. China's foreign ministry spokesman warns if the U.S. goes ahead with his WeChat ban, Chinese consumers will get rid of their iPhones. 
He wrote on Twitter, "If WeChat is banned, then there is no reason why Chinese shall keep iPhone and Apple products." And Australia announced a new bill that could bring an end to controversial Chinese agreements in Australia. The Chinese government retaliated by banning more beef imports from Australian farmers. We spoke to American businessman Ray Zin. He worked in Silicon Valley for decades. He's one of the few who did not move his business to China exactly for this reason. No, it doesn't surprise me at all.、Uh, this is exactly what I would expect China to do. We, we have said here in this country, you know, America first. Zin kept his businesses in America and wanted to safeguard U.S. technology. I knew there was going to be some consequences. If I did move to China, I want to protect the technology that we have at the, at our company.、Uh, I want to protect it, and and to do to do that, I had to、uh, keep my、uh, technology within the uh, uh, the borders of the U.S. Zin says the issue is China has become an economic power and it's taking advantage. He says it needs to trade more fairly. The Chinese government just has to maybe back off a little bit. China is a communist country. Uh, they do have more power over their people than the other countries. China can pretty much dictate, you know, what the people are going to eat, what they're going to drink, what they're, where they're going to sleep, you know, how they're going to live. Zin says businesses should think long term and not only focus on short term gains. Don't be so committed to any one industry, customer, or country that、uh, they 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 have some kind of a chokehold on on your company. So far, the Trump administration has not backed down on the ban. Australia says the new law will ensure foreign agreements are aligned with the country's best interests. And the Trump administration has added another 11 Chinese companies to a Pentagon list, saying they're either owned or controlled by the Chinese military. It's paving the way for new sanctions against the companies. The companies include construction giant China Communications Construction Company, China Three Gorges Corporation, and Sinochem. That's a state-run oil and gas conglomerate. The designations don't trigger penalties, but it allows the president to impose sanctions against the listed companies if he wants to. And Taiwan will ease restrictions on American pork and beef. It's a significant step towards a bilateral trade agreement between the two nations. The limits have always been seen as a sticking point. President Tsai Ing-wen announced the changes today, and you can be sure the Chinese Communist Party isn't happy. China puts pressure on every country not to recognize the Taiwanese government and just treat Taiwan as part of Communist China. Taiwan, of course, is completely opposed to this. As Rupert Hammond Chambers, president of the U.S. Taiwan Business Council, why President Tsai chose to act now. The timing is a is is an interesting question to contemplate. It's likely related to an assessment, two issues,、uh, an assessment by the Tsai government that the window of opportunity with the Trump administration is now,、uh, that、uh, the U.S. obviously will go to a national election November the third here. We do not know what will、uh, what will be the outcome of that, but what we do know is that over the last three years, U.S.-Taiwan relations have been on a roll. And there is an opportunity here to capitalise on any potential shift in trade relations, which brings me to point number two: the President Tsai, after her recent re-election in January of this year, has significant political capital that she can potentially expend, and she has decided to expend it, some of it anyway, on fixing these outstanding issues in the U.S.-Taiwan trade relationship, which she hopes, in turn, will result in some reciprocity. On the part of the United States, at a time when we may be more open to contemplate bigger developments with Taiwan, so these two have converged. I'll bet, as a function of the fact that the Tsai government is willing to move forward, and、um, here we are. The U.S. government is now presented with this opportunity to respond and potentially、um, uh, expand dramatically the trade relationship. Do you think we could see something before November? I do, but I think it's important to understand what what might reasonably be accomplished for organisations like the U.S. Taiwan Business Council, for which I work, and for the government of Tsai Ing-wen, as I understand it. The goal, very much, is to secure a commitment to launch bilateral trade agreement negotiations. That it's, it, I think, it's unreasonable to believe that that negotiations could be launched, negotiated, and. Completed before November. So at the moment, what what what、uh, 
what parties that are in favour of this opportunity, maximising this opportunity, are looking for is a political commitment. And that political commitment, frankly, at its epicentre, is with Ambassador Lighthizer and USTR. Who do you think the big winners on the U.S. side would be? The big winners in the U.S. side, I believe, in the uh, from an economic standpoint, from a market access standpoint, it would be pharmaceuticals, financial services, health, the healthcare ecosystem generally, as Taiwan is an important market. Technology, although there were less barriers to technology, given what we're seeing in the shifting supply chains, reshoring the split in the supply chain now one to serve China, the other to serve the rest of the world. Taiwan is a critical player in all of these areas. And most importantly, in the semiconductor industry, a bilateral trade agreement allows a U.S. administration, the Trump administration right now, for they would be the ones contemplating this, obviously, to look at a bilateral trade agreement and potentially lock in new platforms, new understandings, um, and new focuses on research, development, uh, product development, supply chain security that would be forward looking and better represent, in our opinion, the direction that bilateral and multilateral, uh, 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 bilateral multilateral trade is heading and also the impact of an increasingly aggressive and coercive China. Of course. Rupert, we'll keep an eye on the developments. Appreciate the insights. Thank you. Of course. It's my pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. And California-based Herbalife will have to pay over $100 million to settle a civil and criminal charges. The Department of Justice says it bribed Chinese officials to boost its business there. The DOJ says Herbalife will have to pay $123 million to settle charges for bribing Chinese government agencies and media outlets. The company develops and sells dietary supplements around the world. In the agreement with the DOJ, the company admitted it violated a U.S. anti-bribery law. Authorities say from 2007 to 2016, Herbalife approved extensive and systematic corrupt payments to Chinese officials. The bribery included cash, entertainment, meals, and even travel. In turn, the company obtained direct selling licenses, less government scrutiny, and less negative coverage by Chinese state media. Prosecutors also say the company falsified records to make the bribes look like legitimate business expenses. China accounted for nearly 20% of Herbalife's net sales in 2016. And in the U.S. markets today, the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq both closed at record highs. Would you believe? All three major indexes ended the week higher. Today, the energy sector logged the largest percentage gain with oil rigs, oil rigs and refineries in the Gulf region, resuming operations after Hurricane Laura passed through. The Dow rose nearly 162 points, or 0.57 percent. The S&P 500 gained over 23 points, or 0.67 percent. And the Nasdaq added over 70 points, or 0.6 percent. And American consumers spent more than expected in July. It supports hopeful expectations of a strong economic rebound in the third quarter. The latest Commerce Department report says consumer spending grew by 1.9 percent in July. Economists forecast only a 1.5 percent rise, so the number was better than expected. The Commerce Department report shows spending on goods has rebounded above pre-pandemic levels. Still, money spent on services was below February levels as consumers still try to keep their distance. That's a bad sign for the services-based economy, which slipped into recession in February. Personal income grew by 0.4 percent in July after falling for two straight months, another encouraging sign. Still, economists remain concerned that as fiscal stimulus dries up and the CCP virus lingers, the recovery may be losing momentum. While most economists expect a sharp rebound in GDP in the third quarter, led by consumer spending, many are cutting their forecasts for the fourth quarter because of lingering virus uncertainty. And despite the positive signs, Coca-Cola says it's laying off workers in response to the crisis. It's offering voluntary deals and promising to cut its operating units in half. The company plans to cut 4,000 workers in North America and offer similar deals in other markets. The voluntary packages would cost around 400 to 500 million dollars. Coca-Cola also says it'll cut global business units from 17 down to only nine. 
Last month, it reported a 28% drop in quarterly sales. And still to come, German drug company Bayer says it hit a roadblock in its Roundup settlements. It took over the responsibility after buying U.S. chemical company Monsanto. And the World Bank suspended its well-known business climate report, the one that ranks countries based on their business environment. Find out why after the break. Violence, war, lies, famine, slaughter, tyranny. The devil's arrangements are present in both the East and the West. Turned religion, the family, politics, the economy, finance, military affairs, education, the academy, the arts, the media, entertainment, all into battlefields. Communist ideology is an ideology of the devil the initiator of an unrestricted war on mankind. The question is, why are there so many people who harbor romantic fantasies about communism, help the devil spread its lies, even becoming its obedient tools, to deceive, co-opt, coerce, confuse, and so overturn traditional thought, subvert order, create upheaval, and to divide and conquer with the objective of gaining global control. The British government is encouraging workers to return to their offices. It's concerned too many people are working from home and is hurting downtown businesses. The UK's transport secretary says now is the right time for many people to return to work because children will soon be going back to school. He also said prolonged isolation from friends and colleagues is taking a toll on mental health. This after a business group warned that office closures were taking a toll on the economy as well. It said the government should, should expand virus testing and highlight safety of public transportation to encourage people to return to their offices. But a recent survey found that 9 out of 10 UK workers who've been working from home say they like it and they want it to continue in some form. The country reported about 1,300 new cases today, down from 1,500 yesterday. It's also been increasing the number of tests. And the Eurozone's economic sentiment grew in August for the fourth straight month. It's a positive sign after its record slump in March and April. There were hopeful signs of a Eurozone recovery Friday as August saw economic sentiment rise for a fourth consecutive month. The European Commission said that confidence soared to 87.7 points, above analyst expectations and up from 82.4 in July. The new pickup confirmed a gradual rebound from May and was mostly driven by optimism in the service sector. It remains in negative territory but rose to minus 17.2 in August, up from minus 26.2 in July. Confidence also rose in the industry and retail trade sectors, although factory managers were not so optimistic. Their production expectations edged down after three straight months of improvement. There were warning signs from European powerhouse Germany, though. While expectations for the broader economy improved for a fourth month in a row, German consumer morale fell back going into September. The GFK Institute said on Friday its consumer sentiment index fell to minus 1.8. It followed three consecutive increases from June to August, and it raised doubts on whether household spending is powerful enough to drive a strong recovery. And the UK government's programme Help Out to Eat Out, which gives discounts for dine-in meals, is coming to an end after one month. Entities Patrick Hayden spoke to two restaurant owners to see how it went. The UK government introduced the programme in August. It allowed restaurants to offer a 50% discount on meals up to $13 per person. The government reimburses them for the discounted amount. About 84,000 restaurants, bars and cafes signed up for the programme. 
The latest Treasury data shows that customers used it over 60 million times in the first three weeks. One owner of a Lebanese restaurant says the program worked. Um, we've seen so many people coming to the restaurant, um, enjoying food, enjoying time, and I think it's done what the government intended it to do, uh, to bring people out, to give them the confidence to get back to a more normal life. The program only runs Monday through Wednesday. High demand for only three days of the week has its pressures. It's not been easy because it's quite often oversubscribed. Um, certainly us and our neighbouring restaurants have all commented they've just been so busy. Um, it's sort of unprecedented um, in terms of the number of people phoning, booking. But he's happy to see new customers. Some have even come from far away just because of the initiative. And then you've also got the kind of the new, the new guests who have even travelled quite a distance um, to come and try the food because they're getting something for free, essentially. Another restaurant owner we spoke to also supports the programme. Well, it was, it was a, very, a very good thing that the government did because uh, all the business was suffering because of the lockdown, as we know, it was terrible times. They generate a lot of customers. He's been in business for 11 years but never offered a delivery service until now, and it was a success. I had to do straight away the delivery service because I had no help from anywhere. He says he's spoken to other dining businesses in different countries and they're not doing something like this to help. They've done something really good. In other countries, I don't think they, they've got this. Because I'm originally from Portugal and uh, I've got a brother in America and, and people say in Italy they, no one does all these things. So we're very pleased that the government did that. And uh, I would probably consider continuing even if I don't get the help from the government. Some restaurants say they will extend the discount into September, funding it themselves because it's been so successful. Patrick Hayden, NTD News. And the World Bank says it's pausing publication of its business climate report. It wants to investigate data irregularities. The World Bank says the data changes were inconsistent with the report's methodology and it'll review the past five reports and after the audit, it will retroactively correct the data of countries that were most affected. The annual report ranks countries based on their business and investment climates. The Wall Street Journal reports that one inside source says data about China, Azerbaijan, the UAE and Saudi Arabia seem to have been altered. And shares in German drug company Bayer fell today that after the company said it was having trouble sealing its $11 billion roundup settlement. Bayer says there are, quote, bumps on the road to settling the huge U.S. lawsuits over its Roundup weed killer. The German company struck an agreement in June covering about three quarters of the 125,000 claims against it. The litigants claim exposure to Roundup caused cancer. Now Bayer says that settling is contingent on some kind of deal over what to do about future cases. It wants a scientific panel to rule on any subsequent claims. In response, a U.S. judge has threatened to restart the litigation, asking if Bayer is trying to go back on the settlement, according to Bloomberg News. Brent Wisner says either settle or don't, but drop the indecision. Bayer inherited the headache after its $63 billion takeover of seed company Monsanto in 2018. Reuters sources say a court hearing will be held on September 24th to review the case. And still to come... Live music returns to Southern California. The hotel is hosting concerts that guests can enjoy from their balconies in Huntington Beach. Find out more after the break. When you look at TV networks in America, a soundbite and bited out culture prevails on news and commentary programs. As a Canadian, I'm fascinated with America, and I wanted to offer American thought leaders an opportunity to share their thoughts in a deep dive format where we can explore their ideas together. And so American Thought Leaders was born. 
The world's most brilliant thinkers believed that open discourse was the key to greatness. However, all around the world, we see that discourse is being stifled and political agendas have subverted media. The Epoch Times launched its Global Thought Leaders program to bring back this great tradition of free thought. As the host of American Thought Leaders, every week I interview some of the most intriguing minds on the most pressing issues of our time. Be sure to check out our new episodes every week. Finding somewhere to watch live music can be a challenge these days, but one Southern Californian hotel has found a solution. The Paseo Hotel and Spa is holding rooftop concerts. Guests can social distance while watching from their balconies. The hotel in Huntington Beach came up with the rooftop concert idea as a single event to keep guests entertained during the pandemic. But the show was such a hit with guests that the idea was expanded into a concert series. You know, the initial concept was let's let's just do it this one time and, and see if people enjoy it. And the momentum and the positive feedback has continued to grow ever since. Most music venues have been forced to close during the pandemic. Music festivals have also been canceled. Dana Bennett is a local, but she checked into the hotel with her husband and two kids to see the show. It's nice just to be out and about and do something fun with the family that is safe and yeah so I mean we've always been fans of live music but to see it in this element after the pandemic is really special. Many musicians around the world have been performing online for virtual concerts but as any live music fan will tell you nothing beats being there in person. Kenny Bennett described watching from his balcony. You literally feel like you escape everything in COVID and for a couple hours you can just enjoy and kind of go back and escape. So for us, it's just an opportunity to just escape, enjoy the nice music, enjoy the amazing views of the Pacific City. Concert venues are expected to be among the last to reopen because of the challenges of social distancing. And that's the latest business updates for today. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you on Monday.